So this talk is based off of an ASM blog article that I wrote earlier this year uh, that was really focused on a topic that I think is very interesting, which is scarlet fever. But the impetus for that uh, particular article was that in the last year or so, there's been a really interesting surge of cases of scarlet fever across the, the US and primarily Europe. And there was a, a higher mortality than usual with this uh, particular outbreak. And it just got me thinking a lot about why do we forget about certain diseases? You know, how important is it that we remember the history of certain infectious diseases? And then and why do they come back? And what does it mean for us in the modern era? So this is just a short story about scarlet fever, where it's kind of come from, the history of it, where we are with it today, and why should we continue to think about diseases that maybe we forget when we get, you know, therapeutics that are very effective and tests for those diseases. So I'm going to take us way back to 1553. This is Filippo Ingrassia. So he was a Sicilian physician that was really well known for his contributions to public health. And he did a lot of anatomical observations and, and writing things down. And so I'm sure someone somewhere knew something about scarlet fever before he did, but he was the first to really document it. And he was noting that he's seeing these patients coming in with this rash with spots that were really, really close together. And he said it just looked like their whole body was on fire. And he called it scarlatina. He didn't know what was causing it, but he just kept seeing all this scarlatina. And then through the, the late 1500s, other physicians started to comment you know, on these patients coming in with this rash that they were differentiating from measles, where the spots were a little more spread out. Uh, and they started adding other descriptors. So a couple uh, physicians in like 1564 said, yeah, this also comes with parotid gland swelling and vomiting and fever. And, these are mostly children. Uh, and then kind of randomly, some French nobleman at the end of the 1500s rounded out the definition and said, you know, they're mostly children. They have all these other symptoms. But it seems that they get this sore throat first. And then the rash comes a couple days later. And some of them get very, very, very sick and die. And so epidemics of this continued throughout the 1600s, you know, centuries that followed that. It really wasn't until the 1920s that uh, two bacteriologists, John and Gladys Dick, put together that this infection was being caused by group A strep in the throat. Kids would get pharyngitis with group A strep first, and then they would have all these downstream uh, consequences that were not great, right? So they would get this sore throat, and then they would get this rash, the scarlet fever rash, and then sometimes it would progress to very severe disease. And so that happened in the 20s. So between the 20s and when we got penicillin, uh, really all they could do was quarantine people away. We didn't have any treatment for this, so they would put signs in the houses of, you know, houses that primarily had children that had scarlet fever and said, scarlet fever's here, don't come anywhere near this. Um, and so that was, that was it. You would get scarlet fever and sometimes you would die and sometimes you wouldn't. Uh, but this became a very, very serious cause of uh, morbidity and mortality before we had any penicillin. Uh, this is one of my favorite images ever here. This is a public health graphic from long ago, uh, pre-antibiotics, where you've got these evil animals, of, you know, the main diseases of the time that were killing children. You've got scarlet fever, diphtheria, measles, whooping cough, and you've got this wall of public health <laughs> where you've got quarantine, health officers, physicians, and then these innocent little children on the other side. And the caption for this Graphic says, how high is your wall? <laughs> you know, and this is, this is what they had to prevent uh, death in these children at the time. And uh, I think it's really interesting to look at what the major causes of death were at that time, right? Because we don't think of, we're like, oh, strep throat, scarlet fever. Scarlet fever itself is really not that bad. It's, you know, it, you, maybe a patient doesn't feel well and they get this rash, but Scarlet fever itself is not deadly. It's the progression to more severe disease, right? And so I want to back up just a little bit and talk about the outbreaks that were happening earlier uh, in 20, you know, throughout 2022 and into 2023. Uh, the outbreak started in late summer 2022. And by the fall of 2022, I think it was around November, there had been 13 kids under the age of 15 that died in England alone, which is kind of crazy. Uh, you know, in this day and age. And the cases of scarlet fever that were being reported out of Europe were, like, significantly higher than before. I think there was nearly 5,000 cases reported by the fall of 2022 when the previous five-year average had been, like, 1,200. 
And so it seemed that there were a lot more cases, that the mortality was higher than we're used to, and uh, it kind of gets us thinking a bit more about the impact of things like quarantine and public health measures outside just the use of penicillin and why might this erupt again. So pre-penicillin, lots of people dying, and in fact, this figure here I think is really impressive. So this is from uh, 1866 to 1901. These are the leading causes of death. And scarlet fever is like the ninth leading cause of death at the time, right? Uh, and then we've also got pneumonia, cholera, things like that. So scarlet fever is way up there with these other big significant diseases of interest that, you know, I think we don't always place it there and we don't understand how significant this was. If you work in the lab, you've probably worked up group A strep many, many times. This is a really interesting organism. It's interesting that it causes such severe disease. And it's interesting to think about why some people get so sick and others do not. Uh, so in the 20s when uh, Gladys and, and John were figuring out that group A strep was the cause of this pharyngitis in patients that had scarlet fever, they noted that some of them would progress into very severe disease, but some would be totally fine. Uh, some children will get colonized with group A strep and have no downstream sequelae of any kind, and some get very, very ill. I think it's about anywhere between 15 to 30 percent of uh, patients can be, people can be colonized and not have disease, right? And so what's interesting is that group A strep is a very toxic organism. It produces these super antigens that promote or elicit this enormous immune response in some people, but not everyone. And I think if you think about COVID, it kind of, there's kind of a, a link there in terms of thinking about, it's so strange, some people get really, really sick and some don't. There's a lot behind just infection with the organism, right? And so in some patients, this toxic uh, super antigen causes what's called a cytokine storm. And that really excessive response by the immune system is ultimately what causes things like septic shock or toxic shock or you know, organ dysfunction down the road, et cetera. So interesting to, to think about this very easy to identify bug and, and relatively easy to treat and that it can cause such a spectrum of disease. In the lab, it's very characteristic. So it grows on blood auger. It's got this huge zone of beta hemolysis. And if you're not familiar with looking at these plates, maybe this doesn't look like a huge zone of beta hemolysis, but it's very, very big. So it's a small, small colony with a really big zone of hemolysis. So sometimes just by looking at the plate, you know it's group A strep before you do anything else, right? If you've been doing micro long enough, you can look at a plate and say that's group A strep. And it's very easy to identify. So if you're a lab that doesn't have MALDI, it's no problem. You do a catalase, it's negative. You do a PYR, it's positive. Maybe you're still using bacitracin disc. I don't know, it should be susceptible. But really simple, easy biochemical tests. You don't need fancy diagnostics to ID this organism. It grows pretty well, it's fine. Uh, and in terms of treatment, even though penicillin's been getting used forever for this, uh, there's no resistance really noted. So penicillin is still a really effective therapy. We don't need anything fancy. And so that might make everyone say, well, then why are we seeing this outbreak? Like, originally when I read the uh, report, I think it was from World Health Organization trying to you know, assess why there might be an outbreak of, of extra significance right now. They said, well, maybe there's macrolide resistance or maybe penicillin isn't working anymore. And the answer is they don't really know for sure, uh, but we tend to see these outbreaks of, of um, scarlet fever happening after uh, periods of respiratory disease or when children start to go back inside. So when we're coming off the summer and then there's a lot more crowding and you're obligated to go to family functions with a lot of people or you're going back to school, church, whatever, um, we start to see more of these strep throat infections and then subsequently see more uh, scarlet fever and things like that. So they think, you know, COVID made everything very weird, right? So we had this period of time where children weren't really exposed to much. They were inside a lot. And so there could be this waning immunity uh, that they may have with them that prevents these big bursts of um, this disease in particular and others. I think we saw that with other things as well. Um, and so they think maybe that's what happened is this combination of uh, an early return to a, a kind of significant and severe respiratory season and then waning immunity and then going back to school and things and being around a lot of other kids and people, perhaps that's what's exacerbating this, but they're not really sure. And so I just think the whole point of all this is, you know, I, I love infectious disease history. I love thinking about who figured out what, when, and where these things came from. But the really important point is that we, 
should never forget our history when it comes to infectious diseases. I think we get a little bit comfortable with our really fancy tools and perhaps you know, any sort of treatments we have for things, but we should always think about why these diseases we've long forgotten and, and don't think about much anymore might come back to the surface, how we would handle them, how we would manage them, uh, and why we should care that they're still around, right? And it, it may not always be due to antimicrobial resistance and things like that. So I spend a lot of time in the antimicrobial resistance phase, but this is a great example of one where we've got a great, you know, simple, easy treatment. Uh, it's very easy to identify, but we still see these surges uh, that are deadly, um, particularly in children. So I just encourage us, you know, to always try to, you know, if you're in the lab or if you're in clinical practice, try to understand where these diseases maybe came from and how they've evolved over time and why we should keep them front of mind, you know, as we're living in, in the modern day world.